G'day folks and welcome back for the fifth video tutorial in our mini library of chemical thermodynamics uh, content and we can talk about Gibbs free energy. So we've come through a short journey so far and we introduced some terminology which you really need to know talking about the thermodynamics topic. We talked about the first and most recently the second law of thermodynamics with respect to entropy. We've had a bit of a look at calorimetry in, with respect to coffee cup calorimeters and bomb calorimeters. But it's absolutely time to start talking about the Gibbs free energy, often just called the Gibbs energy or often also just called the free energy. So if you hear any of those terms, it's all talking about the same thing. The Gibbs free energy, which conveniently has the label G, is given by this equation. So the Gibbs free energy equals the enthalpy minus the product of the temperature by the entropy. So at a constant temperature, delta G equals delta H minus the temperature times delta S. And of course, for standard state conditions, usually at 298 Kelvin, we can say that delta G naught equals delta H naught minus the product of the temperature by the change in the entropy naught. Most importantly, it's the Gibbs free energy which may be used to determine spontaneity, so whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. Unlike enthalpy, the Gibbs free energy is highly temperature dependent because that temperature term appears in the equation. The free energy combines the system's enthalpy and the entropy together. So delta G is a measure of the spontaneity of a process and, if you like, of the useful energy available from it. And therefore, we've got this term, the so-called free energy of the system. And it's all we need to determine spontaneity. And so if we're considering the Gibbs free energy of the overall system, we might have the equation looking a bit like this. And so the sign of the delta G term indicates if a reaction is spontaneous. So if delta G is less than zero, it's a spontaneous process. The overall change in the entropy of the universe is greater than zero. zero. So you're increasing disorder, therefore it's a spontaneous process. If delta G is greater than zero, for an, it's a non-spontaneous process. In other words, the change in the entropy of the universe is less than zero. And we've talked about equilibrium in a previous set of these video tutorials. Well, it's, some, it's sort of a nice connection here that you can combine thermodynamics and equilibria together. And that's done through something called the reaction isotherm, which we'll cover in the next video tutorial. But this is really the crunch point here. If delta G equals zero, you're at equilibrium. So we've previously kind of thought of these two topics of thermodynamics and equilibria as separate entities. Well, they're not separate entities at all. And we'll explore that a little bit further as we go on. At any rate, to understand delta G and spontaneity, you need to understand entropy. And we talked about entropy a little bit in video tutorial number four. Just a few definitions with respect to some of the labels that you see. So delta G naught with a subscript F is the standard Gibbs energy formation of a compound. That is the change in energy that accompanies the formation of one mole of a compound in its standard state from its constituent components in their standard states. We've seen delta H of formation for, um, for molecules in the past. Well, this is really just the Gibbs free energy equivalent of that term. The delta G naught with a subscript R is the standard Gibbs energy of a reaction. So the standard, uh, should say, the change in energy that accompanies the reaction where each component is in its standard state. In other words, we're dealing with state functions here. So it's this, the difference between the standard free energy of formation of each product and each reactant. Algebraically, you would express it like this, and much in the way that we have seen uh, this combination of enthalpy terms 
uh, as their state functions, you can just subtract the delta H of formation of the reactants from delta H of formation of the products. You can do the same thing for the Gibbs free energy. Here's another really important point. By definition, delta GF and delta, uh, delta HF, okay, so the change in the Gibbs free energy of formation in the standard state or the change in the enthalpy of formation in the standard state for an element in its standard state are zero at all temperatures. It's a really useful piece of information. Thermodynamic functions such as delta H, delta G, delta U depend on the quantity of matter and the conditions. And these must always be stated. An element said to be in its standard state when it's in its thermodynamically most stable form at a given temperature and a pressure of one atmosphere. Here's a few examples. Hydrogen at one atmosphere at room temperature, it's going to be a gas. Whereas iron, you know, is far more likely to be a solid. Well, I can tell you it's not far more likely. It is. It's a solid. The standard state for carbon is graphite. Standard state for oxygen is oxygen as a gas, O2, not ozone. So ozone would not be in its standard state. And so it would have a delta GF and a delta HF naught, which is not zero, whereas oxygen, it is zero. Mercury, as you know, is the only metal which is a liquid at room temperature. So it would be a liquid in its standard state. And sulfur, you may not have realized, but sulfur is in an S8 molecule in solid form when it's in its standard state. Let's solve a couple of problems. Here's a nice simple one. Uh, what have we got? We've got uh, liquid ethanol burning um, and it combusts to give carbon dioxide, water. Okay, so what's the question? Determine delta G naught for the reaction at 298 Kelvin for the combustion of one mole of this material. Use the data in the tables below to answer the question. Well, step one, write out the equation for solving a delta G naught for the reaction. And you've got this generic equation here where you take the Gibbs free energy of the products, all of the products, and from that you subtract the Gibbs free energy of formation for all of the reactants. Let's write this out in a little bit more detail, and I'll just make sure I've got some electronic ink here somewhere. Okay, so delta G naught of the reaction is going to equal, now what do we focus on first? We focus on the products, and so we've got, don't forget the stoichiometry is really important in this equation, so two times. the Gibbs free energy of formation for CO2. And to that, we're going to have to add three times the Gibbs free energy of formation of H2O. Of course, in its liquid form, we might want to include that there. And these are state functions, so we can just subtract them from one another. And so we would want to take the Gibbs free energy of formation for ethanol and add to that the delta G F of formation of oxygen. In fact, we want three of those because the coefficient in the equation is three. Okay, so that's our general form. Let's insert some values from the table below. So just taking the previous, oops, what have I got here? Let's get some color happening. So what have we got? We've got the delta G of the reaction equals, and we said it was gonna be, these in brackets, two times. Delta G of formation for carbon dioxide is minus 394. To that, we will add <clears throat> three times, because I've got three moles of water in the products, 
3 times minus 237. And from all of that, I'm going to subtract the delta G of formation of my reactants, which is just one mole of ethanol and three moles of O2, which is an element in its standard state. And so it has a delta G of formation of zero. Sub all of that into the equation and I get, I think, hopefully, I've got the right answer here. Just change colors. Delta G for the, naught, the reaction naught equals minus one, three, two, four kilojoules per mole. Cool. In the correct units, well, look, those units are fine. I mean, if you wanted to express them in joules per mole, you could. Um, there's not really any point. I think the answer is fine there. Uh, so that's that's an example of, of <clears throat> determining the delta G naught of a reaction using delta G naught of formation values. You don't always have those values. Sometimes you might be more likely to have a question which looks a bit like this. Uh, so what have we got? We've got um, this stuff here. This is, uh, you know, it's on matchsticks and so on. This stuff is a really strong oxidizing reaction. Gives off a fair bit of, uh, fair bit of heat. Um, matchsticks and stuff like that. And anyway, so what have we got? We've got a question. Calculate the free energy change for this reaction uh, from the enthalpy and entropy data. Okay, so... In this case, we haven't been given delta G naught of formation values. We've been given delta H naught uh, of formation values. And what else do we have? We've got some entropy values there. So in this case, I think we're going to have to use that the equation that we saw uh, previously, which was, uh, let's see what color I've got here. Still in the blue. So delta G we saw can equal delta H minus the temperature times delta S. Okay, so we've been given these values here in the table. We've been given those values there in the table. And we were told that the temperature is 298 kelvins. So we should have all the information we need. We just need to crunch some numbers. So let's start. And we won't even think about entropy at first. We'll just focus on the enthalpy term. So I'm just going to come back to red and I'm going to, I've got this equation nice and expanded. I'm going to work out the delta H naught value for the overall reaction. And so I start by taking my products and I have uh, three of this molecule here in the product. So I'm going to take uh, from the table, what have we got? It has a delta H value of formation of minus 433 and to that I'm going to add the delta H of formation for potassium chloride which is minus 436.5 they're my products and from that I'm going to subtract the enthalpy of formation for my reactant which is four lots of what have we got minus 398 Sub all of that in, and I should get a value that looks a little bit like this. 143 minus 143.5 kilojoules per mole. So guys, is it an exothermic or an endothermic reaction? I'd call that a pretty exothermic reaction. So minus 143.5 kilojoules per mole. That minus sign means it's exothermic, giving off lots of energy when this thing goes off. Let's move on to the entropy side of things. Okay, so it's a similar sort of procedure. These are state functions, and so we can just add them together, or I should say we can add together the, enth the entropy of our products and subtract from that the entropy of our reactant. And so we just sub it all into the equation, and there is the entropy of our products and I'll subtract from that the entropy so four times because those coefficients in the equation are really important okay just as a coefficient of one of course 
And we've got four times, what is this, 143. And I sub all of that into the equation. And I get something like minus 36. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice here that we've got our units in joules per Kelvin per mole. So let's have a think about this. We'll just go backwards for a second. Uh, where was I? Okay, here's the previous slide. We have our enthalpy term, and it's a minus 143.5 kilojoules per mole. Or, you know, I interchange the way I write these things. Kilojoules moles to the minus one, yep. A little bit different to what we saw on the previous page, on the, sorry, on the subsequent page, which was our entropy, our delta S naught for the reaction of minus 36 joules per Kelvin per mole. So the first thing I'm seeing is that I have a per Kelvin this time. I don't have that in the enthalpy term. Also, I'm not dealing in kilojoules, when, which is what I had for the enthalpy term. I'm just in joules here. So you know, if I'm going to combine these two pieces of information, I am going to have to do a conversion of one to the other. Personally, I like to convert everything across to joules. You don't have to. You could convert the entropy term to kilojoules if you wanted. In this case here, I'm just going to uh, convert to. I'm going to convert to joules. I think. Let's see. Okay, what color am I in? I've got red. That'll do. Delta G naught for the reaction equals the delta H naught for the reaction, which I think we worked out to be one minus 143 kilojoules per mole. Well, I want to combine all this stuff, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this into joules per mole. So to convert from kilojoules to joules, I multiply by 1,000. Which would give me a term which looks like this. Yep. I now go minus 298. That's the temperature in Kelvin multiplied by my enthalpy term, which was minus 36 joules per Kelvin per mole. And since I'm putting all of my units in as I go, I'm going to keep my units in here as well. How does that look? That looks all right. And if I throw all of that into the calculator, crunch the numbers, I should get something which looks a bit like this. You'll notice that the Kelvin here and the Kelvin to the minus one here, when multiplied by each other, should cancel. And that's why we don't see that Kelvin term in the units of the final answer. If you really wanted to, you could convert your answer to kilojoules per mole. Delta G values are normally expressed in kilojoules per mole, but you know it's fine to leave it in joules per mole. There's nothing about that you need to worry about. But it's just critical that you're really careful about that um, conversion that happens somewhere before you start combining those values. Anyway, guys, that's Gibbs Free Energy. Um, I hope that's making a bit more sense now.